what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars, who ended up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. Peter came out and talked about how they built that up. Uh, P90X founder Tony Horton talked about how he made money as a street mime. Gino, you know, when he drove cross country, that's how he made food and apartment money. He w- put his hat on the street, it was a street mime. And then later on, obviously went on to sell hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X. Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about, um, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor and Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. Um, So check out more episodes. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. And we do that through our done for you podcast solution. And I believe if you are a business, you should have a podcast period, period, hands down. I personally credit it to being the single best thing I've done for my business and my life outside of meeting my wife. Actually, my friend Jordan Harbinger, of the Jordan Harbinger who met his wife through his podcast. Um, But the podcast has allowed me to connect with amazing and form amazing relationships with my business partner, best friends, countless referral partners. And we basically help you completely run and launch your podcast, most importantly, to get you ROI. So we take that 30 minute conversation distributed across 11 to 15 different channels, including your blog and social media. We've been doing it since 2009. And in my opinion, Gino, you know, this isn't, you'll relate to this. This isn't just about your business. It's about you leaving a legacy for yourself and for your guests. And it's much more personal to me because the inspiration is actually behind podcasting. Inspired Insider is my, the interview that the Holocaust Foundation did with my grandfather who survived Nazi Germany after being in concentration camps. And him and his brother were the only people out of their entire family to survive. And the video published the, the, the interview they did with him is published on my about page. Um, and so yes, podcasting will help your business, but it also helps you and your guests leave a legacy. So if you have questions, first of all, if you start a podcast, if you have questions, you can email us at support at rise 25.com. Um, I'm super excited for today's uh, interview and uh, we have Gino Wickman and he's found, talk about making an impact. He's founder of EOS worldwide. Uh, an organization has helped over 70,000 companies use and implement EOS tools the entrepreneurial operating system. Um, you know, they've built up an international team of over 300 professional and certified EOS implementers. He's the author of many books, including Traction, Rocket Fuel. I, you know, I had Mark Winters on talking about Rocket Fuel in a previous episode. It's amazing. I use integrator and visionary terms on a weekly basis because of that book, and I encourage anyone to get that book also. How to Be a Great Boss and many more. Um, his previous books have sold over 1 million copies and his latest creation is called the entrepreneurial leap. And do you have what it takes to become an entrepreneur? Uh, he created it to help entrepreneurs in the making, get a huge jump start on taking the entrepreneurial leap. So you can go to e leap.com to get a free chapter. Listen, Gino for 20 to $30 to learn from someone like Gina, who has successfully sold two businesses, helped tens of thousands of businesses, with, within the trenches advice, it's an absolute steal. So just go to, go to Amazon, go to Audible, get the book. I listen to it on Audible. It's fantastic. So if you're a parent or teacher and you want to identify the six essential traits, um, I think you owe it to get it. Like me as a parent of two kids, do you, know, um, you know, I listen to it and thinking, you know, some, and we'll talk about this, you know, you have certain beliefs about an entrepreneur. So it's really key to hone in on if your kids have these six essential traits. Um, so out of high school, Gino just wanted to start making money. So he went straight into the workforce. He went from machinist to real estate to at age 25, taking over the family business. And that was in debt at the time to EOS system to the present day. I'm going to stop talking. Gino, thank you for having me. Thank you for being with me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to start, I mean, there's so many questions I have, but I wanted to start with your dad and mentors in general. We talked about your book, right? It's a virtual mentor, you know, when you have books. I know you're a voracious learner, a voracious reader. 
Um, so I wanted to talk about some of your mentors and I want to start with your dad. Um, your dad, um, if you can talk a little bit about your dad's background, um, I know he was like one of the number one real estate uh, sales trainers. Um, talk about your dad for a second. Yeah, no, I'd love to. So my dad is a badass. <laughs> so he is a badass. He, he is. He's, he's the ultimate entrepreneur. <clears throat> Absolutely one of, he, he was my number one mentor. There are two mentors I had in my life that had the biggest impact on me. And one of them was my business mentor, Sam Cup, who taught me everything about business. My dad, I consider to be my life mentor, my people mentor. He taught me everything I know about, <clears throat> or most of what I know about people, leading people, communicating people, selling to people. Uh, he's just the master. And so he's a Hall of Fame speaker of the National Speakers Association. So just a rock star platform speaker. And he built the number one real estate sales training organization in North America back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And created a program called Sweat Hogs that revolutionized how residential real estate agents um, are trained to sell and earn six-figure incomes. And so he, he left quite an impact. Uh, and he's still around making an impact, but yeah. quite an impact on that industry and the world. Yeah. I watched a bunch of videos um, and I know you and him, I think he was friends with Zig Ziglar. I remember in my car, listening to like see you at the top and born to win audio tapes in my car. Fantastic stuff. Well, um, well Zig, just to, to clarify that Zig was my dad's mentor. Mm. So it was, so that's, you know, where my dad got a lot of it from. So they were very, very close. What advice did your dad give you that was, I don't talk about some, you know, we'll talk about what your dad, what advice your dad gave you, but what do you remember him relaying to you about Zig Ziglar? Oh, wow. There's, there is so much. Um, so for me to have instant recall, uh, I'm going to try. And so well, let me start with this. Your yep. favorite dad sayings, you know, because what I remember was, you know, like his sayings ring in my head, oh. you know, help as many people as, as, you know, get what they want, you'll get what you want, those type of things. What are your there's, favorite? Yeah, there's two that come to mind as we talk maybe more, but, but you know, one thing that always stuck with me was his saying, there's nothing special about special people. It's what they do, not who they are. Mm. And I've heard him say that a thousand times. And so that had a huge impact on my life because I'm just a regular dude. You know, I mean, I didn't go to college. Uh, I could barely speak English when I was 20 years old. I, I um, so I, you know, there's nothing special about me. And so I just work my ass off. And so that, that one is, was very, had a very profound effect on me. Um, and then another one was whenever you're um, making a tough decision, whenever you're dealing with something in life, a difficult situation, it really only comes down to three choices, live with it, leave it, or change it. And so that I have used mm. a thousand times in the last 25 years. And so think about every aspect of your life, bad people that you're with, employees, personal, an issue you're dealing with, a problem. It, you apply that to every decision. It crystallizes your three options. And at the end of the day, um, if you decide that you cannot change it, um, you don't want to leave it, then you just got to live with it. You got to live with that tough situation and stop bitching about it, quite frankly, would be, I'd take it one step further. So that has had a huge impact on me. Mm. And, and there are literally 30 of those, you know what I mean? And so I wish totally. they, they come to me constantly. And so I'll, I'll recall as many as I can as we're having this conversation. Change it, leave it, or live, live with, with it. it. Leave it or change it. Live, live with, with it, it leave it, or change it. Got it. Yeah, when I was watching your dad's videos, one of my favorites, it's just simple, but like the way he, you know, framed it. First of all, he tells some great stories, but he, he kept... By the way, my, dad, my dad's name is Floyd Wickman, if everybody knows who we're talking about. Floyd Wickman, yes. Look up Floyd Wickman. I believe his website is floydwickman.com. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but he just kept saying, convert your goal to activity. And he said that probably multiple times in this talk, convert your goal to activity. And... And that makes, you know, when you think about like, yeah, like if you have a goal, just convert it to the activity you needed to do. And he was talking about, obviously, when he went in and wanted to be the, one of the number one trainers, um, he, the guy's like, just do, all you need is five appointments and just get you know, five appointments. I don't know if it was a week, five appointments a week and you'll be the top salesperson. And so, you know, convert the uh, goal to activity. 
Yeah, and then one other thing I'll grab there is, you know, you mentioned the book Rocket Fuel, my book Rocket Fuel and, and with Mark Winters and the visionary integrator concept and how popular that is for you. I came up with that while running the family business mm. because my dad was the visionary. I was the integrator in that relationship. And it was a bunch of data points that came to me that came to create that you know, label for those two roles. But my dad and I were this dynamic duo, visionary integrator, and that's how we were able to turn that business around and, and get it growing again. So he's the original visionary in, in this last 25 year journey. And now the 70,000 visionaries that are, you know, living this. Life. Yeah. I encourage anyone to get rocket fuel because it helps you kind of compart, you know, if, if you're one or the other or combination, like who should you be getting on your team to get that rocket fuel, you know, because you need both. Here, here, here. Um, so the, what percentage, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in Entrepreneurial Leap, you talk about six essential traits and I'm curious, you know, fusing rocket fuel into that a little bit. If you have an implementer and a visionary, is there a percentage of like, okay, there's a certain amount of implementers that maybe shouldn't be entrepreneurs or do you see a percentage well, swing the there? Term implementer, I assume you mean integrator, right? Integrator, integrator, yes, integrator. And you're asking specifically what about the integrator? Yeah, in integrator. Is there, like if you have seen uh, integrators, um, you know, if we look at overarching, someone's an entrepreneur, um, a certain number of integrators are second in command, right? Yes, yes. So have you seen um, a certain percentage of integrators are, yes, they, they maintain the, these six essential traits? Or have you seen, you know, maybe all integrator types are, have these six essential traits? Yeah, you're, what? Yeah, you're asking a very important question. And so now I want to just, just for your audience and your yeah. listeners to, under, I want to create a little context so we have clarity here. So, um, you know, everything we're talking about now is all part of the system I created, EOS. And in the visionary integrator concept, is vital in terms of what you need at the helm of an entrepreneurial organization. And when we talk about entrepreneurial leap, um, that's going to be a very different conversation. And, and we'll come back to that. And that's all about helping entrepreneurs and the making discover who they are. But the tie together between the two, just so we're not confusing that listener, is a person in entrepreneurial leap that we're going to talk about that exhibits those six essential traits, which we'll also talk about is a visionary in the making as well. So now to come back to your question, you know, so, so textbook, absolutely pure definition of a visionary and integrator, a visionary is that founding entrepreneur with those six essential traits, this wild and crazy being that has ADD and they're the builders and the creators of almost everything on the planet. A visionary, a pure visionary, like you've, like we're talking about, the ideal scenario is they need to be counterbalanced with an integrator. An integrator is very, very different than what I just described because an integrator runs the day-to-day -day of the business. They're the glue. They harmoniously integrate all the major functions of the business. And so those two roles are very different. And so I would not cross those definitions because that can be dangerous. Now, if that makes sense, absolutely there are visionary integrator dynamic duos that co-found a company. That's what I did with my partner, Don Tinney. And so that integrator, while they may not have all of those crazy six essential traits, they're still a business owner and partner with that visionary. Right. But if you're a pure integrator, that's your God-given ability, COO, number two, whatever you want to call it, um, odds are you're not going to go take your own entrepreneurial leap. You want to attach yourself to a wild and crazy visionary, and that combination will absolutely be rocket yeah. fuel, hence the name of the book. Yeah, that's why I mentioned it, because if you're reading and listening to Entrepreneurial Leap, and you have some of these tendencies, and then the thought of it really excites you, but you are an integrator type of person, more operations you want to implement, then you sort of need, from what you're saying, you need to kind of team up with someone who is that visionary. Yeah, hitch your wagon to a visionary. And that's one of the prescriptions I give in the book because if you don't have the six essential traits, but you do have a passion and a love for entrepreneurship, yeah, just hitch yourself to a visionary. And what's 
important to understand is there is a rare small number of people, one out of 20, that possess both abilities to be both visionary and integrator. I happen to be one of those. That's why I was the integrator in the family business. But at the end of the day, given the option, I'm a visionary. I want to play in the visionary seat. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get to the six essential traits, but I want to, you know, so Floyd Wickman, your dad was a big mentor. Um, you mentioned Sam Cup. Sam Cup, I think, you had mentioned in the past has built up a $300 million business. What it's were some of companies? Yeah. Totaled $300 million yeah. revenue, annualized revenue. What um, lessons did you learn from Sam? Uh, <laughs> so many. So the, the, one of the greatest things I learned from him that is one of the main tools in the EOS system that I created is a scorecard. So he taught me scorecarding and scorecarding is as I've come to define it. It's basically just looking at your weekly numbers and having a pulse, but I define it as having identifying the five to 15 most important activity based numbers for your business. So as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, those are what you look at every single week. You're looking at that scorecard. It has 13 weeks of patterns and trends. And so you have a pulse on your business at any given point. So he taught me that powerful concept of scorecarding, measuring, having a pulse on your business through numbers. And you would meet with him regularly. Yeah. So in the beginning, in the early stages, we met every month for mm -hmm. probably, I would say, three years and then less frequent after that. But every month, one to two hours for three years. And I would come to him with all of my questions and my problems and my issues. He would give me his two cents. And, and so I just kind of learn at his feet almost mm -hmm. as an apprentice. It was the most incredible opportunity. Was there a certain format? Yeah. That, you know. And when I say it was an incredible opportunity, it's an incredible opportunity affordable to anyone listening. You just got to go out and you got to find your mentor. So there was a format and, and I highly recommend that there always be a format, but the format is not the same for every mentor protege relationship. And then ironically, we're talking about this subject. My dad wrote the book on it. So he wrote a book called mentoring. So, um, yeah, it's out of publication. He wrote it 25 years ago, but you can still buy it used on Amazon. And he walks you through A to Z how to do this. And then I actually boiled down the whole book into a page in this new book, Entrepreneur Leap. So I do teach the reader how to go find a mentor and all that. But in terms of a format, again, for me, it was an hour or two every month. Um, but, you know, meeting once every quarter, meeting once a year, meeting once. So you just got to figure out what the right formula is for you and your mentor, because it really comes down to what it is that you want, what, what it is that you want, what it is you're trying to learn, do you have multiple mentors, but, but yes, agreeing on a format and committing to that, and for us, it was monthly. Hmm. Another, I don't know if you call him mentor, but, um, and this will, I think, help tell a little bit of your journey, because I want to give people kind of an overview. <clears throat> if you can quickly give a timeline, so quick overview, so you went out of high school, machinist, mail order business, what was next? Real estate? Um, travel, travel business. I thought I was going to open a travel agent. So I went and sold corporate travel, learned very quickly that that was not for me. Um, then real estate investing that led me to having real estate agents running around connecting, collecting a commission that I decided I want. So I went and got my real estate license. Then I stumbled into the real estate industry, did very well for myself there. And then having been a real estate agent, making a six figure income at 23 years old, taking all of my dad's training through his business partner, I fell in love with that company. And so then getting involved in, involved in the family business, going from making six figures to 25 grand a year, starting at the bottom, selling his products door to door, working my way up through the organization, took the business over as president within a year and a half, did the turnaround, ran it for seven years, we sold the business, so sold the business, stayed on for a year and a half, then took nine months off, took a nine month sabbatical to go soul search, get back into shape. That whole experience nearly killed me. I had a full head of hair going into that. <laughs> um, so got back into shape, um, bred like a madman, and then tried to decide what my next thing was, which I discovered. Then um, set out to help entrepreneurs run their companies. After five years of doing that, I honed and refined and created EOS. 
joined forces with a partner, Don Tinney. And over the last uh, 12 years, he and I built that company to what it was. We sold it last year and uh, still own 12%, still own all the books. I'm still the EOS guy. But now this next era is going to be yeah. all about entrepreneurial leadership. Yeah. I just wanted you to give an overview because it's, uh, you know, overnight success mean, after 30 years. You know, I had a little fun color for your listeners. Yeah. Through that whole timeline, um, uh, let me see the math. Broke at 21, broke at 24, and flat broke at 32. So that will help as well. So I was a millionaire by 31 and $200,000 in debt by 33. Not just broke, flat broke. Yeah, and having the six essential traits are a blessing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's it's overnight success after 30 years. Um, But one of your mentors, um, which kind of relates to the timeline, is Mike Palin. I don't know if I pronounced his name right, Palin or Palin. 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 Mike Palin, um, because he had an integral, he, he kind of was inserted in some of these um, turning points, right? I'm glad you brought him up because um, I call him my guardian angel. He's in the acknowledgments in every one of my books and he has stepped into my life. Um, he worked for us in the family business and um, he was, um, he and my dad were an incredible team from the training and, and the stuff that they did. Anyway, at three points in my life, he, he, he literally altered the course of my life. And, uh, and so the, quickly, those three times yeah. are um, asking me to speak at an annual event on business, which I was terrified to do. I was a year or two into running the family business. He saw something in me I didn't see in myself. So I spoke to a thousand people on how to run a business. And, and that was a, a, a light bulb moment. Why was that a turning point? Um, point for you? because I realized that I love to teach Mm. and I love to talk about business and help people run their businesses. So the whole thing was how to run your business successfully. Got it. Number two was during that nine month sabbatical when we sold the business, I finished my year and a half transitioning the leadership team. And so during that, he handed me a book called the monk and the riddle in the book, basically in a nutshell, was about a guy who called himself a virtual CEO who helped business owners. And, and I finished that book and the light bulb moment was there that I am gonna become a virtual CEO. My corporation is called Virtual CEO. And so I realized at that point that there is a place in the world for people like me to help business owners. And so that was number two. And then number three, he is the one that introduced me to Don Tinney, my business partner that helped me take uh, EOS Worldwide to the moon. And that's all Mike Palin's doing. So I, he's my guardian angel. It's, it's incredible how he just steps in at the right time and hands me something, be it a person or a book or an opportunity. Why did he introduce you to Don at the time? Well, because I, when I decided that I'm going to leverage EOS, mm-hmm. um, I said to myself, I've got to find that person, I called it. And I bullet pointed out these 15 bullet points that was the perfect partner for me mm-hmm. to help me take the company to the next level. And, you know, things like you certainly the core values and all that, but somebody who is open to a risk reward situation. And and so uh, I put that out to my network and Mm. Mike Palin said, I got the perfect guy for you. And what were some of those? Do you remember some of those things on that original? Yeah. So it was, you know, all of my core values. And so some of my core values are things like do what you say, grow or die. So, So somebody that exhibited those kind of things. Um, The risk reward scenario said that they are comfortable, you know, making only deriving what they make and possible equity through performance. So that was really important. Um, It was somebody that, you know, was capable of running the day to day, somebody who was capable of keeping up with my pace. Uh, somebody that was able to, my deal with EOS Worldwide, because I was also working with clients, I devoted 45 days a year to EOS Worldwide in those first 10 years as the visionary of the company, and that's it. And so somebody that was comfortable working in those parameters, so things like that. So it's just me yeah. painting a vivid picture of yeah. this person. And I, you know, I just believe you, when you have that level of clarity for who you're looking for, and you put it out to the universe, it always comes. And that's, and that's what happened through my guardian angel, Mike Palin. Yeah. I mean, it's a big lesson because 
um, you really documented it out and you thought about it. And if you didn't do that, he may have not come up with that name at all. Now, I would have ended up throwing somebody at the problem and, and we'd be miserable two years in. The other interesting part is some people just forge ahead by themselves in these situations. And you oh, knew yeah. I need someone, I need a partner in crime. Most do. So going back to that visionary integrator conversation, most visionaries go it alone for the first five or 10 years. You know, and that's what EOS is, a big part of what EOS is about is we're helping this visionary who's killing themselves, who's absolutely hit the ceiling, realize you're missing this piece to your puzzle. And once they bring that piece in, boom, they grow to the next level. So yeah, most go it alone until they realize, holy crap, an integrator is going to save my life and my company. So I want to hone in on, as you, you heard from the intro in the beginning, I, you know, people see you really influential, really successful. So I like to hone in on the flat broke day. Yeah. Because it wasn't always like that. And you talk about this in your book actually is there's a dream scenario and a nightmare scenario, right? And some of the things that people can do to avoid that nightmare scenario. So Start with that, but I, I will go back to that point in time, that flat broke time. So talk about the nightmare scenario and then some of those things that people can you know, help them avoid that nightmare scenario. And, um, a, a little more, another piece of context mm -hmm. again for the, for the listener. So now we're obviously, we're moving into this entrepreneurial leap content and book. And what's really important for your listeners to understand the book is written in three parts. Uh, Part one is called Confirm, part two, Glimpse, part three, Path. And there's, there's a science behind those three parts because Confirm is first and foremost all about making sure and confirming that they even are an entrepreneur in the making because you know most aren't and some are and it's all about having those six essential traits. Path is once you confirm that you are an entrepreneur in the making, uh, or I should say Glimpse, Glimpse is all about showing you what is possible, all of your mm -hmm. options, and then Path is showing that entrepreneur in the making, a path when they take their leap and do their startup, a way of making that road less bumpy and increasing their odds of success. And so with that context, you're asking some glimpse questions and I just want your you know, listener mm -hmm, to be totally. what we're talking about. And so in glimpse, what I'm doing there is that in terms of your question is I'm showing them a day in the life of an entrepreneur, both heaven and hell. So the dream scenario, the nightmare scenario, and then I give the eight mistakes to avoid to avoid the nightmare scenario. But the point there is I'm wanting this potential entrepreneur in the making to see what's possible, both good and bad. And when they see that contrast, I think it's going to help them avoid a lot of mistakes, but also it's to help them understand that most entrepreneurs are living the nightmare. It's not all it's cracked up to be, but it's very possible to live the dream. And so, you know, when you talk about some of those things, you know, I just, in the nightmare scenario, it's an entrepreneur that is waking up at the wee hours of the morning, showing up to the office with a bunch of disengaged employees that are showing up late, has no passion for the customer or the client. That entrepreneur is working twice as hard because they're having to do half the employee's work because they're not engaged. They're charging the lowest price in town because it's the only way they can keep the customer. And the second the customer finds a cheaper price, they're leaving tomorrow. And that poor entrepreneur is burning the candle at both ends. Their family's frustrated. They drag themselves in the door at nine o'clock at night. And, and so that's the nightmare. And I'm, I'm giving you, you know, a third of the story there. Um, and then there's certainly a dream scenario, which I get to see my clients live every day and is, and is very doable. So, you know, so with that, I give eight mistakes to avoid. And these are the eight most common mistakes that entrepreneurs make when they start their business and where it stems from is these are all the mistakes our clients come to us at EOS with after they've survived startup. And every single mistake was avoidable. And so when we talk about you know, me joining forces with Don Tinney, my partner, way back at the beginning, I had the luxury. That started, I'm trying to do fast math here, but you know, my mid to late 30s. Um, I had enough experience that I could launch this new business and avoid every mistake. I don't say that to brag. I say that to prove that it's possible. I also started my business knowing that I was a visionary and I needed an integrator. So I started with my visionary integrator duo right out of the chute, which not everyone can afford to do or make sense to do, but it made the journey a hell yeah. of a lot better. I mean, some people don't even know to do it. Exactly. Also. So that's where, you know, this whole book is about that saying, I wish I knew then what I know now. Yeah. 
this is a way for them to know now what they need to know then if I said that right in reverse, you yeah. know? So, <laughs> so, so we can certainly talk about some of those mistakes. I want to go where you want to take Yeah, them. Yeah, just, just talk about a few of those, yeah, of so those eight. Some of my favorites, I mean, they're all, I, I, couldn't put, I couldn't put them in any kind of a weighted order, but um, one is hiring the wrong people. And so when I talk about our clients that come to us at EOS, on average, a new client that comes to us has to get rid of 20% of their people. 20% of their people don't fit. 20% of their people are the wrong people. And so what happens, the mistake is all through startup as the organization's growing, they need a person. And so that entrepreneur just throws a body at the problem. And all of a sudden, here they are a year or two or three later, with two, three, two, three year later, two, three years later, with people that don't fit. So they hired their brother, their sister, their aunt, their uncle, you know, their best friend, the neighbor, when they should have slowed down just a bit and hired people that have their core values and fit in the culture and have the skill set to do the job. Um, and so that's, that's a big mistake. Um, another one is not charging enough. So there's a, just a psychological issue with people. They're just afraid to charge what they should be charging. Um, and so this one is, you know, so you think about a startup breaking even for all these years and even losing money. Well, the difference between losing 5% and making 5% is a 10% price increase. And so, and, and, and it's having had so many clients raise their fees, um, it's seamless. And then there's two great nuggets I would offer is number one, there's a great TED talk, Casey Brown, hmm. who's a master. She teaches people how to get their heads around and address the psychological issue around pricing and price right and educate your customer on pricing. And then uh, Dan Sullivan, one of my business coaches, the greatest entrepreneur business coach of all time, he has this great saying where he says, when it comes to pricing, pick the number that scares you the most and then add 20%. So, so, you know, so there's another example. And then there's, you know, six more that are all avoidable and will greatly increase the odds of success. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, back to the flat broke thing. Okay. Yeah. I know I like jumping around a little bit, so I like that you give context. So thank you for that. Um, 32 flat broke. Um, I don't know if this is a scenario, but this is what I wrote down. I want to make sure and touch on this because this is a tough time. I want you to paint the picture of what's going on at the time. I think at one point you talked, you're at, in the kitchen with your wife. How many kids do you have at the time? So people, you know, you have a family at the time too. So this is not just like a single Gino in uh, a dorm room, right? This is, you have a family. Yeah, this is, uh, I'm trying to think of the ages. This is like a, uh, I think an eight year old. I wrote five and eight. Yeah. yeah, five and eight, and yeah. uh, uh, exp relatively expensive house. Yeah, um, bills to pay, and and I had taken an entrepreneurial leap with little or no revenue coming in. So I basically burned through all of the money I made, had saved through my twenties, late twenties, and and in selling the business. And um, so, to context, you sold the family business. Yep, yeah. and then you invested the money. Yeah. And, and with that, it was the dot com crash. So I have terrible investments that went to zero. I mean, just I was going to turn that money into multi, multi, multi millions. And so I just didn't think I could do any wrong. Terrible, high risk investments, while at the same time bleeding cash because I just started a business and I had bills to pay. So it was like the perfect storm. Uh, it was, it was brutal and excruciating. And my wife stood there right by me at my side and I just completely fucked up and she fully supported my idiot behavior <laughs> has been at my side the whole way. Good intentions, of course. So what did you do to get out of it on the other side? I just worked my way out of it, you know, so it's, I was, I was hyper focused. I was um, inflappable in terms of my belief in what I was creating and what it was going to do in the world. So number one, I put my head down, focused, focusing on building that. I certainly cut back as much as I possibly could, you know, on expenses. Um, we actually put the house up for sale. So I was worst case was going to sell that house. Um, and then fortunately, you know, started turning the corner and, and turn the corner. And I have been one hell of a conservative investor ever since. <laughs> so what did you do at that point? What turned the corner? Was this uh, then the, this is the beginning of EOS? 
Yeah, this was the beginning of EOS was me finding companies that would let me help them, having no idea how the hell I was going to help them. So finding one and practicing on them and finding two and listening to their problems and creating tools and calling on all the authors and thought leaders uh, that I have been reading about and learning about and then honing and refining and creating tools. And so in that very first difficult two years, it was finding my first client. I would charge a daily fee for my time. And so I was charging that daily fee and then finding another one and another one. And I had great networkers that were big fans of mine that would refer me clients. And so found one, then another. And then by the time I had five or 10, then they started to refer me. I started to build a reputation, uh, started to see some huge results. And, and it all kind of took off from there. And so it was one daily fee at a time covering a you know, six figure nut and then surpassing that and then reinvesting in the business. So it's a, a pure 100% bootstrapping yeah. effort. Uh, John and I started EOS worldwide with, it was like, I, I had to text him because I couldn't remember, but it was like three grand. You know what I mean? So this, this bullshit about, you know, going out and raising funds and venture capital. And the first step, everybody thinks entrepreneurship is go raise money. No, 95 plus or minus 2% of people don't raise money to start a business. So right. most people you go bootstrap. sell, please bootstrap. We did it on no debt. We've never had debt. Uh, anyways, I've become a very conservative, aggressive entrepreneur. Yeah, I mean, what I wrote third and final time. Gino, what I wrote down is rough first year and a half, two years. You were, you were in the coffee shop, as you say, pouring over the dots, and um, you changed the model. One of the things that that helped change things around you changed the model a bit as far as the I don't know if it's pricing or licensing. Talk about what you did there that actually turned the corner. Yeah. So, um, well, so what you're talking about is, I feel like you went and you interviewed all the people in my life because I'm wondering where you're getting these DM uh, insights and questions from. So um, um, this was a year and a half into Don and I building the company and the model was, so I had created this system, EOS, this, this holistic operating system for a business and nobody was calling it an operating system back then, a system for managing people. There were certainly software operating systems, now everybody's trying to create an operating system. Um, so I had created this thing and it was working and it was working well and it was you know, helping to grow great companies and that wonderful stuff. So Don and I joined forces to then take this thing to the world by building a team of EOS implementers. And so it's really hard to do to go find these needles in haystacks, but we would find one, then two, then three, 50% failure rate, uh, but we just kept finding them and finding them and finding them. Well, about a year and a half in, we probably had, I don't know, 15 implementers and the model just was not working. Um, and so Don and I were still pulling no money out of the business at that point. I was working with my clients. My revenue came from my work with my clients. His revenue came from his work with his clients. Um, and so the business just was not economically working and it was generating enough to run the business, but it was a break even business. Um, so, uh, realizing it wasn't working. I love this story, by the way, you know, this is cause everyone right now, a lot of people can relate to this. They could be in this right now. Like what's going to help turn the corner. Right. So yeah. keep going. Yeah. So, um, so what the model was at the time is, is the EOS implementers were paying us a licensing fee. They were paying us a percentage of the revenue they generated. It's like 15%. Well, when they're generating zero revenue, 15% of zero is zero. So the model just wasn't working and I started to get fed up because we're killing ourselves teaching these people how to be successful and they just weren't being successful for whatever reason. And so I was sitting in a Starbucks, I spent a lot of time in a Starbucks, that's where I go to think, and I was armed with two books, okay? So I'm reading two books. Um, one is called uh, a Seth Godin book about tribes and the other one was a book the starfish and the spider and it's about mm. starfish organizations and spider organizations and um pouring over all of the issues brainstorming and this is just little old me sitting in starbucks and i and, and i had a light bulb moment and i i saw clearly exactly what we needed to do and we needed to create more of a starfish organization um where it wasn't as much command and control, it's offering autonomy to these, to these implementers. Um, and then the tribes piece was just really seeing 
this open source, abundance-based, culture-based organization. So long story short, I leave the Starbucks, I call Don and I say, Don, I'm about to turn our business model on its ear. And what we shifted to is where they just paid us a monthly fee to access all of our content, to learn how we do what we do. It was a fee-based model. They would pay to come to our quarterly trainings. They would pay to come to the initial boot camp. And so they, whether they were making money or not, they had to pay to play. And all of a sudden they started pr producing more. Our top implementer at the time went from paying us 45, 45 to $60,000 a year down to 10 grand a year. Wow. So for the really successful ones, they got a huge pay increase. And, but for the ones that weren't paying anything, all of a sudden you got to start paying or get the hell out of here because we're going to be a bunch of successful people or you don't belong here. So that changed everything overnight. And I walked into that meeting of the 15 implementers, terrified, scared to death, did not sleep that night because I had to do the present, the present to give the presentation of my life because I was about to rock their worlds. Um, and that's the story. Yeah. You know, for some of those people, they were excited, but most of them, well, there were two that they, were excited. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the rest were not very happy. The most like, so you have to pay for that was excited. I mean, it, yeah. was, it was brutal, man. Don and I killed ourselves. And, and also Don and I were faced with, you know what, maybe we just got to just go back anyway. So it's, it's, it was a scary time. We did not know if it was going to work at the same time. I was going to figure out how to make something work. It needed to change. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what I also find interesting, Gino, with uh, EOS is you had a very specific succession plan mm -hmm. over a five-year period. Yes. And just talk briefly about that, what you're thinking around that, because I would say most people I talk to don't think of a succession plan in general. They think about selling the business. You were really methodical about this. Yeah. Well, so for one, I, you know, having had all of this experience, having seen this with so many clients, you know, I just, I, I don't believe that an entrepreneur is destined to kill themselves at the helm of their organization for 30 to 40 years, unless that's what they really want to do. You know, I believe the reason you start and build a business is for freedom, uh, not lack thereof. And so once Don and I you know, finally got the model right, got the business growing. The business grew 40% every year for 10 years. Um, it was time for a succession plan because I did not want to sit in that visionary seat. I had desires. So when I turned 40, I said, when I, at 40 years old, I said, when I turn 50, I'm going to put my energy now into a new project, which is this Entrepreneur Elite Project. So I already knew that I wanted to do other things. I wanted to build other things. Organizations sometimes get big enough where it's not fun to the founding entrepreneur anymore and they gotta go do their next thing. But mm -hmm. I would never leave the company in jeopardy. So with that, five years before the day I was gonna step out of that seat, I started my succession plan and it was very methodical. I started to look at who in the community might fit. That's what we call all of the people in our organization the community who may be outside, whittled it down over a year or two to the one person I thought was right, started grooming that person. Uh, and then the two years before that transition date, he would then assume the role, but I would be there side by side coaching advice and all the way up to the day that Mike Payton took over as the visionary for the organization. And then Don Tenney did the exact same thing in his integrator role. And so roughly four or five years ago, four years ago, Don and I completed our succession plans uh, Mike Payton replaced me, Kelly Knight replaced Don, and then those two became the dynamic visionary integrator duo that have been mm -hmm. running the company now for a few years. And, and so all of a sudden, Don and I are just kind of sitting on the board of directors, playing an advisory role completely out of the day-to-day, -day, which was so freeing, while it's still growing 40% a year, which was awesome. Um, but it was about being methodical, like you're saying. So it's so important that if you are an entrepreneur looking to succeed yourself out of your role, you're not going to do it in a year. Um, and it's very rewarding if you do it right and your business isn't going to complete, it isn't going to implode if you don't. Um, but long story short in that position, you know, I realized it was probably time to sell the business. We actually got approached. We didn't sell to the people that approached us, but it really got my gears turning that I think now is the time. And then we, you know, went through the whole process of vetting a bunch of buyers and deciding who was right for us. Yeah. And so you went through a little bit different of a path to selling 
not the not what was advised, right? Well, the one, the everything I do is not advised. <laughs> but but I think the biggest thing that you might be speaking to is, you know, every advisor says, "Don't tell your people that you're going to sell." And right. in the day I decided to sell and in, engage that investment banker, I told all 200 people in our community that I'm going to sell. That was probably the second biggest presentation of my life because. You can imagine how terrified everybody was because everybody expects the worst as they should because the worst usually happens. And, um, and everybody knows that the owner is going to stand up there and say, everything's going to be okay, you know, which is a bunch of bullshit. So, you know, I just was very open and honest, very real, very vulnerable, gave them the eight reasons why I'm doing this, assured them that I'm going to do everything in my power. And then the other unconventional thing I did is um, – Peyton and Kelly were earning equity in the business. So I gave all four of us veto power. If at any point, any four of those people felt that, the, that selling the business was wrong, they could pull the plug and have total veto power. So that really helped. So all that said, I am in no way advising your audience or anybody selling their company to tell all their people because yeah. most, that worked for you. most cultures can't handle it and it will be a disaster. So I repeat, I'm not advising this. And every advisor will tell you not to, but I did it because that's what helped me sleep at night. And, and our culture was strong enough. Um, and I'm open and honest enough. I mean, it's, it's a transparent organization that, you know, that's, that did 80% of the heavy lifting for me. Yeah. But some of the, some of the buyers were EOS implementers too, right? So yeah. did, did sharing that help? I think so. You know, we sold the private equity and, and as we were going through the process, I just shared with the private equity company that my dream is that the implementers can invest in this company. And if, if your listeners know how private equity works, you know, the private equity is going to put a bunch of money into this thing. And all they did is they opened up, you know, whatever the number of millions it was and said, if you guys want, we're going to open up this much. And, and I think we had 30 mm -hmm. of our implementers invest. That's amazing. So they got to be partners in the business. That's great. And so, you know, now they're my partners because I own 12% of that business. I'm a very silent partner, which I love, and I'm focusing my energy yeah. on the new thing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, let's talk about Entrepreneurial Leap. And first of all, you can go to e-leap.com. There's a quick assessment. I, sh I actually encourage everyone to go on there and take the assessment. There's also, you can get a free chapter there, but um, just go on put your assessment in and have it forwarded to you. And I want you to talk. Let's, yeah. let's quickly hit that. I'll do this in, in 30 seconds for you. So that yeah. your listener, the assessment is going to help you determine if you have those six essential traits and get ready. Here they are. Visionary, passionate, problem solver, driven, risk taker, responsible. If you don't have those six essential traits, odds are you're probably not an entrepreneur that's going to build a 10 to 250 person privately held company. Odds are, and that, that assessment will help you. And that's all part of the confirm step in the book. Thank you. Yeah. And they should have their children. If they have kids who are teenagers or beyond, they should tell them, go on, take this. And, if yeah. they and so my goal in hopes and dreams is that, you know, my, my math and everything I've seen in the work with Rocket Fuel, I believe it's about 4% of the world has these traits and is a true entrepreneur. And so my intent is to find them wherever they are, because in some cases, it's a 14, 18 year old. In some cases, it's a 40 year old in the corporate world that followed the path and realized, holy shit, I don't belong here. They, they hate sitting at that desk and they just want to. So that's an entrepreneur in the making. And so I want them to find them. So yes, but then like you're saying, if you're somebody that teaches and educates entrepreneurs in, in the making, if you're the parent, a guardian of one, yes, this book will help you understand mm -hmm. them, help them understand themselves. And so, yes, please, uh, it's a great resource for that. So, Gino, out of those, I know you dedicate a lot of time. I don't know if you, you know, they're not in any particular order, but you dedicate a lot of time in the book about the passionate piece. Yeah. Why? Yeah, and, and with that, you know, so in that first part, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that reader in, in to great detail and painting in vivid color each of those six. In the path part of the book, I get into the vital importance of passion and finding your passion because passionate as a trait is you having passion for your product, your service, your thing, this reason you're taking the leap. 
And so that's why it's so important in the path step of the book for you to discover your passion. I'm a big believer. It's, it's passion that is going to help you endure the tough times. If I was not passionate about what I wanted to bring to the world with EOS, I would have never had that light bulb moment in Starbucks because I would have quit. It was, I mean, it was excruciating. <laughs> who would kill them? Who would, who would put themselves through that much stress? So anyway, long story short, um, you got to know your passion. And, and so then what I do is help understand what that means, why that's so important, but how to discover yours. Now that's because I'm a, I'm a practical how to toolsy kind of a guy. And so I get into then how you do that. I'm not just saying, go find your passion showing you <laughs> what to do it. You know, you know, you see, so you have confirm glimpse and path and back to the very beginning. What I think is important about this book is you, you have a, I don't know, in some circles would be controversial and some not, but born an entrepreneur versus learned your stance on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I love it and it's controversial. And I think, I think the world is split down the middle on this one, but I am convinced that it is absolutely nature over nurture. You are born with these traits. They are genetic. And what's interesting now with all this work around genetics and DNA and all that, they're starting to see the genes that are entrepreneur genes. And so you're going to know when your kid is born on day one, that whether they're an entrepreneur or not. So I look forward to that day coming. But um, so I believe you're born with it. I absolutely believe it's genetic. And then so like one little example I like to give, and there are a lot of them, but you know, so the six essential traits, number six is responsible. And that one's always a little bit jarring to people because they're thinking, how is responsible an entrepreneurial trait? Well, it is because it's a true entrepreneur takes total responsibility for the outcome. When they drop the ball, they look in the mirror, they say, that one's on me. Um, and so people that blame everyone for their problems will struggle with entrepreneurship. And so there's two types of people in the world, people that blame everyone for their problems. And then there's people that take total responsibility for all their problems. Well, here's how you know it's genetic and it's nature over nurture. Because in a household with four kids, you can put everybody in the world into one of those two groups. Well, you'll have a household with four kids where two kids take total responsibility. Two kids don't take any responsibility. How the hell did that happen with the same parents parenting them for 18 years? So, you know, you're born with it. It's, it's, and, and by the way, to whatever degree of responsibility you take, whether you don't or you do, ex extreme cases of those are both psychological disorders because people that take too much responsibility, it's as much of a disorder as people that blame everybody for everything. So I'm not here to say which one is good or bad. I'm just telling you what is. Mm -hmm. When I look at all the successful entrepreneurs I've worked with, I've interviewed, I've talked to with all of this content for the last 12 years developing this and writing this book. Do you... Um, as far as people thinking this is learned, this, th let's say someone completely disagrees with you, right? It's not, you're not born with it. You learn it. What's the biggest argument you see people have for, for the being learned? And then how do you, what do you tell them? Yeah. So, well, first of all, you know, my favorite thing to say is entrepreneurship is not something you do. It is something you are. Mm -hmm. And so with that statement inherent in that, you know, I, I do get concerned uh, about people trying to teach a process to be an entrepreneur right. because, because the reality is, you know, here's the process to being an entrepreneur is best. I can give somebody a process. You have an idea, you take a leap, you get your ass kicked for 10 to 20 years, <laughs> and then you emerge a successful entrepreneur, hopefully, <laughs> Because odds are you're going to fail if you look at the odds. That's the best. Because when you take the leap, there are 7,000 different issues, directions, pivots, as they say, you know, evolutions you have to make. And there's no book you can read on how, what I did in that Starbucks, there wasn't a book I can read that said, here's how you change the model of an e So, so it's, it's, those traits are what help you survive that. So when you ask, you know, what's my best argument when somebody's saying that, I, I haven't, what I like is that I have not had too many people debate me on that. Just mm. so, so maybe more people believe this than I think. Mm. Um, the responsible trait argument I just gave you is the first one I always go to. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't, I don't have this other nugget because the responsible one is probably the biggest nugget because that's the one I use yeah. most. You know, what I'm 
it's interesting because that's kind of the fundamental premise, you, you know, and you go, you take the assessment, you learn whether it's your child or whoever it is. Um, and it, maybe it puts them on a faster path to what they should be doing anyways. And think of Gino in high school, right? Um, how would you have structured or changed high school knowing that you were an entrepreneur? Like at that time, if you're like, this is my DNA, this is what I'm going to be doing. You know, obviously I know, you know, I'm doing research. You weren't successful in terms of GPA, you know, if you judge it on GPA, yeah. what, how would you have changed? How do you change the, the education system now to support yeah, someone no, I, who knows they're an entrepreneur? Yeah, I love that you're asking that because, you know, the whole reason I, I wrote this book is the old saying, we teach what we needed the most, Daniel Kennedy saying, uh, we teach what we needed the most. So I'm teaching my 18 year old self who is lost, confused, right. and secure. So, you know, the beauty is there's some things I wouldn't change because I was savvy enough to know that college wasn't for me. So as my friends went off to college, um, I had the balls to not go. Um, number one, number two, <clears throat> I was doing entrepreneurial things all through high school, which people should do. So I was selling candy, selling fireworks, selling, I was selling stuff. I was doing stuff. I was shoveling driveways. I was cutting lawns. I did all those things to make money. So I was practicing, 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 learning. I sold stained glass that my brother made. Um, so those things I wouldn't change. And again, yeah. for me, I wouldn't go to college. I do a whole chapter in this book on college or not. And it's really fascinating because I'm not saying if you're an entrepreneur in making, you shouldn't go to college. You should probably take some different classes than what you think you should take. So I go into that in great detail. Let's not do that now. But to your question, what I have learned, had to figure out the hard way is how to educate myself. So the reason I'm writing this and what I would do different is I wish at 18, I would have known that I was an entrepreneur in the making. And that's what I hope this book does. Because if I had known that, I would have been a lot less insecure. And I may have still done all the jobs that I did because my urging is please go get to work, work, do stuff, try a lot of stuff. It's the only way you're going to figure out your passion. So I don't know mm -hmm. that I would change, change a darn thing, but psychologically, I would have been a different person because I was such an insecure, scared person from 18 to, you know, 20, mid to late twenties until I really realized what I was and that there's a place in this world for me. Mm -hmm. So that's, it would have, yeah. my psyche would have been different, mm -hmm. but I, don't know I would have changed the damn thing mm -hmm. because they were all, they all taught me so much. Yeah. You said at some point when I think when you entered into EO, you looked around and realized, said, um, everyone's as fucked up as me. That's it. That's the line. And so I'm sitting there, six to 12 meetings, and we met every month. And we're talking about <laughs> our problems, and we're solving each other's problems. And these are the, some of the greatest people in the world, just great entrepreneurs. They're, they're my, still my lifelong friends. But I sat there, and I looked around, and I'm thinking, because I thought I was the only business owner dealing with these issues and this screwed up and all that. And, the, and you, you have the quote exactly right. And I said it in my head, I did, didn't tell them, but I looked around and I said, wow, these guys are as fucked up as I am. And it was that moment that I went opportunity, man, there is a freaking opportunity to help these people. So that was, you know, 28 years old. And so I had already started to get clear. I had already done that talk on how to run a business that Mike Palin got me to do. So it's all these great little data points that got mm -hmm. me clear and clear, but that's, yeah, that's when I realized, yeah. holy cow. And half of them ended up becoming my clients. I left the organization because of it, because it wasn't healthy to be on a forum table when half of these people are your clients. But uh, that's... Yeah. Gino, I just want to be the first one to thank you. I want to end on one thing. Um, just thank you for your time. Thanks for you know, sharing your knowledge with the world. So I encourage everyone to go to e-leap.com, check out the book, take the assessment, get a free chapter of the book, um, order on Amazon. Um, at some point, we're going to put out a couple, we're going to give away a couple. John and I are going to give away several of the Entrepreneur Leap books. Um, so I figured we'd end on books, some of your favorite books of all time. You're a voracious learner. Um, and, and one of the last parts of Entrepreneur Leap is you list a laundry list of resources and books and podcasts. And so some of your top books of yep. all time, outside of your own, which we mentioned. 
Yeah. And so I, I won't be able to remember them all. So that, that no, list, the list yeah. of books and resources in the book that I wrote is also on the website. So please, any books <laughs> I miss, you're going to see my list of books. Just go to e-leap.com, uh, like Jeremy said, and then you'll see that under resources. They're all listed there. But from a, from a business standpoint, Good to great, even though some of those companies don't exist, is a masterpiece. Built to last, masterpiece. Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni, masterpiece. Um, 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 so I'm going to try to remember. Uh, you know, Think and Grow Rich, I know, is a big one. Think and Grow Rich, huge. A must read for any entrepreneur in the making. Um, Bo Burlingham's first book, why am I forgetting the name of it? Uh, help me there. Is it uh, Small Giants? Or Small what? Giants, phenomenal hmm. read. Um, e Myth by Michael Gerber. Um, um, great book, Get Out of Your Own Way. Dr. Robert Cooper is a really, that one was pretty impactful for me, focusing on the individual. Um, Unique Ability by Dan Sullivan. Um, oh, there's so you many. You mentioned business, so is that what other category? And I bounced a little bit back and forth, but The Road Less Travel has a big, had a big impact on me. That book's about 30 years old. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, still timeless. Um, if you can get your hands on uh, the Earl Nightingale recording, The Strangest Secret, I'm guessing mm. you probably find it on YouTube. I have it on audio cassette. <laughs> I, I listened to that audio cassette. 20,000 times in my 20s. So this mm. is a secret. Um, so those are, uh, those are. Yeah. Some. Thank you. Thank you again. You know, check out e-leap.com, the entrepreneurial leap on Amazon, Audible. Thank you. My pleasure. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand